is a process that might take years of deprogramming someone who's been in this fear-based fitness culture for 40 or 50 years. Right from the time they were a little child and they were very impressionable, right? That fear was set into them, right? They got bullied or hurt or roughed up or, or terrorized. And that sort of continued through their adult life. Before there was even, um, you know, the internet, uh, there was women's magazines and men's magazines. Welcome to the Culture Club. Conversations on gym culture and the future of physical fitness. Uh, the other day, I was talking with Michael Campy, and uh, the conversation took a little bit of a dark turn, where we're starting to look at the world around us and and wonder, you know, when's the the other shoe going to drop, so to speak. And I was saying, you know, I don't know that it'll necessarily be uh, this time around, but there is sort of a sense, I think. Uh, living through the the COVID nineteen pandemic and just observing things in the world that times might not always be as comfortable as they've been for the past fifty, sixty years, seventy years or so. And the reason that I frame our conversation in these terms is because uh, you're a, a proponent of you know this term functional fitness, and as people talk about you know what's functional and what's going to be functional moving forward. Uh, a lot of that could end up playing into how people are capable of responding to a, a period of crisis. Uh, so you're up there, you're in the sort of the hills, hill country of California, our mountain territory. Uh, so I guess maybe it'll take a little longer for th for things to break down there than, than here in the city. Uh, <laughs> and I say that somewhat tongue in cheek, but uh, where, tell me just first of all, where are you coming from right now? I see some medicine ball or some uh, exercise balls in the background. Yeah, yeah. So um, the, the place I'm in right now is called the Center of Movement, and it's right in downtown Grass Valley. And this is uh, actually a really beautiful um, building that was probably built in the 1850s. Um, the drop ceiling doesn't make it look beautiful, but um, the brick walls and, uh, you know, where the original floor still exists, it's amazing. Um, Center of Movement is kind of an interesting place. It's a, you, some people call it a Pilates place because downstairs there's all these Pilates machines, right? And the owners are, are trained in Pilates. But um, they're, they're not like most Pilates people I've met. And I'm, one thing they did was they headhunted me into here, right? So they've got their own way about, their own way of thinking about stuff and their own way of problem solving. They're not uh, locked into um, a sort of narrow Pilates view of uh, health or, or fitness. Right. So what, how, how would you say that your approach differs from a mainstream fitness approach? Well, um, the way it differs is this. Everywhere else you look on the American uh, fitness landscape, Basically, the whole focus is on modes, right? So, for instance, before I was here, people would hear things like, oh, I heard Pilates is good for your core. I heard Pilates is good for your back, right? And they would go do Pilates. Um, that approach, and I'm not, I'm not isolating Pilates in that, in that approach, um, that, that mode-centric approach, but because uh, they do it in yoga, they do it in body pump, they do it in CrossFit. Here's the thing. If you're looking at it that way, you've missed the whole point from the very beginning. Where we should start is this. What is your goal? Got more than one? What are your goals? And then start constructing an exercise program that supports those goals. And you don't end up talking about modes at all, right? And so that's one of the big problems. We've got more than one problem here in this country, but that's one of the big, one, big ones. Um, and it leads to this Frankenstein approach. So break, break it down even further. When you talk about modes, just pr pretend I'm a complete fitness novice 
and the modes is that like isolation exercises thinking of things in compartments or a mode is just a way of doing things okay so um pilates is a mode yoga is a mode uh body pump is a mode uh jazzercise is a mode uh, um, what else is a mode okay and so what happens is you get focused on the mode and unfortunately if people decide to to take yoga because you heard it was good oh qigong is a mode tai chi is a mode so you decide you're going to take yoga because you heard that you should be more flexible right everyone needs to be more flexible so you decide to take a yoga class well you go to that yoga class and you just go in there and you whatever it is they're doing you try to keep up and you sink or swim see the problem there and then while you're there you know maybe one of your uh yoga colleagues uh, you know because you're struggling and and a lot of people are struggling uh, one of them says well you know what you really need core strength and you're like really core strength well how do you do that and someone says well you you should take pilates classes that really builds your core All right and so then oh, you're already taking three three yoga cl classes a week right so then you go over and you take some very expensive uh, uh pilates classes to build up your core still no one's asked you about your goals and you haven't thought about your goals because the system of fitness marketing is not set up for you to ask about your goals for anybody else to ask you about your goals or for you to even think about your goals and there's a reason for that can you guess what that is why is that i'm gonna punt <laughs> as soon as someone starts talking about goals what comes up mighty quick is the person uh the customer will start thinking and maybe even start asking well why the fuck haven't i <laughs> made any progress towards my goals right i've been going to the gym for 20 years i've been taking yoga and pilates and body pump and tai chi and qigong for 20 years why have i not made any progress towards my goals so that that conversation about goals is super uncomfortable inside this unsuccessful culture of fitness and so um the people who sell fitness will basically do anything to avoid <laughs> to avoid that conversation right 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 yeah michael, yeah, michael and, I and i are trying to force, to force the conversation. conversation in a sense or at least alert people to the uh, opportunity and it's actually a, a smart business move to think more about these values because if you align your values with your customers, uh, you'll have a dedicated community. They'll be your evangelists out in the broader community, bring more people in who have a similar mindset. And while there are some kind of universals of functional fitness, like being strong to be useful, uh, like being uh, prepared for, for the potential natural disaster. Uh, I, by the way, I was listening to a podcast you did recently with Ron Jones, uh, on the lean berets and you guys were talking about, you know, maybe it's too early to panic, but it, it's never too early to prepare. Uh, and so this question of, you know, wh what is the goal? What is our, uh, you know, what is the function of fitness and your, uh, your whole practice is called form is function. Um, kettlebellform.com is, is the website, but, uh, just talk about that those three words form is function i've heard that a lot of places but I'm, I'm not sure i know exactly what it means okay so form is function the reason i finished i picked that name this was like 21 years ago um is uh there's a famous quote that always stuck in my head even when i was a, a little kid and it is for the, the short version of it is form follows function right beautiful it's elegant right. the bigger part of it is it is the abiding law of all things organic and inorganic that form ever follows function now that's part of a, a bigger thing like a little a little essay by a, uh, an, an american architect named uh lewis sullivan 
who uh, wrote that in 1896. And he's famous for uh, designing a lot of the uh, skyscrapers in, in Chicago. But that little quote about form follows function uh, just really um, struck, a, struck a note with a lot of people. And it's, it's been famous ever since. And so I wanted to get the, the feeling of that quote into the name of my, uh, my organization. So that's where the name comes from. I think about a related idea of uh, how life sort of evolves or, or adapts within a, f a force field of different kinds of stresses. And so we have, you know, heat and cold. We have uh, gravity is a, is a stress. And the, the form of our body is kind of the perfect glove fit for all of the stresses that we were surrounded by in our uh, in that critical period of, of evolution. Uh, and today, there's a bit of a mismatch between a lot of people's lives, and we've eliminated some of the essential stresses that our bodies relied on to be naturally strong. And so we've become, whether it's hunched over our phones, uh, deformed by desks and chairs, as uh, it's another point that Ron Jones makes about students uh, sitting in schools all day. So you come at this from the perspective of kind of the the master builder, uh, and your slogan is, let us rebuild you. So as the, the master carpenter, uh, first of all, what are your tools? You know, this is a conversation I avoid. Because if we start talking about tools, that brings the conversation away from the more important things. Right? Um, if I was a master carpenter and you wanted a house built, we wouldn't talk about tools at all. We just talk about the house and that's one of the reasons, one of the reasons we have all the problems we have in this country with health and fitness is because of that disarranged um, and unfocused conversation, which is all about tools and modes. And it shouldn't be about that. It should be about goals. See what I mean? And here's the thing. A lot of people, uh, they, they see my pictures on um, social media. They see all the kettlebells, right? And they get distracted, unfortunately. And, you know, it, it's my job that I've been working on for a few years to try, to try and get people back on focus. Uh, but they see the kettlebell and they, oh, they want to ask me 100 questions about kettlebells. But, of course, none of those questions are a useful question. And none of the answers can be useful. So I have to kind of bring the conversation over to goals. Um, and here's what I tell people. Sometimes I'm telling this to people who have been my students for a while. I say, uh, don't fall in love with those kettlebells, hmm. right? Uh, because you might come in one morning and they'll all be gone, hmm. all right? Just like uh, 15 years ago, uh, people came in in the morning and all the dumbbells were gone, right? And people were saying, oh, where's, where's my favorite dumbbell? Right? And I said, you know what? Um, it's gone. I found something better. Right? And all it is, is it's like, a, it's like if, you're, if your carpenter bought, bought a new hammer. That's all it is. You know, or started using a different kind of nail. The house is just as beautiful. In fact, it's more beautiful, right? The carpenter's making improvements. The carpenter's making changes. You don't need to know about it, really, all that much. You know, um, you know, of course, someone who's exercising is a little more involved with their coach than you might be involved with your carpenter, but it's a, it's a good analogy. And so uh, someday I might throw all those kettlebells away and replace them with something else. But that's not the important part. The important part is, are we able to get people to clarity about their own goals, right? Can we help them make that decision of what they really need and really want and then give it to them or guide them to it, you might say. We're not giving them anything. <laughs> they got to work for every, every single gram of success. So we're just guiding them. Yeah, it is a good analogy. The, the kettlebell as the, the carpenter's hammer. It's, it's just a tool. And even if it might be the best tool for the job and, and the job being, you know, transforming somebody's body or getting them into better shape, uh, rebuilding them, 
when someone comes through your doors, if they have a particular kind of discrepancy in the way that they move or they have a particular way that they've been deformed or that they need to be rebuilt, how do you diagnose that and what are the different ways that, without getting into modes again, um, you know, how do you deal with people on that sort of case by case basis? Does it start with the conversation about goals or does it start with more of a functional movement screening diagnostic? It starts with a long, detailed discussion of goals. Hmm. And part of that discussion is discussion of injuries, which every adult has. And um, it's there, during that discussion, um, when we get, by the time we get to the end of that discussion, it's usually about an hour, sometimes it's a lot more. You know, we just need to get through a certain level of understanding before that conversation can be over. By the time we get to the end of that conversation, that person has decided whether to be my student or not. The next time we get together, that's when there's an assessment. And I have used the FMS, there's a mode, right? I don't mind talking about it because it's excellent, right? Um, and I've figured out a few years ago how to do a decent FMS uh, like we are right now on Zoom. Hmm. You, you figured that out yourself or is there a course that, that or is something that you had to piece together? I couldn't find any um, support on that, so I figured it out myself. I took it slow. Well, that's a valuable skill. If, if you can do that and if you could even teach other people, I bet you could build a whole separate online business about that. I'll leave that for the, the entrepreneurs in the audience to, uh, to ponder. But do you want to talk about that process at all? Uh, sure. What I, what I do is, uh, so according to the conversation we've had, the very detailed conversation about the person's injuries and their goals and their limitations, um, I'm... By the time we meet again, um, I've already thought a lot and problem solved a lot about what I want to see them do, All right? And so I watch them do it. And of course, each time I watch something and learn something, that adjusts my plan, right? I, I don't make a list of things and just follow it. I'm adjusting according to what I see each step of the way. Hmm. This is this is what coaching is all about, real coaching, right? And real teaching. Real time adjustments. Real time adjustments, absolutely. Course corrections, as Dan John would say. I'll bet he said that a couple times in, in your interview. Um, so by the time we get to to the end of that session, I've got a really good sense of where they're at and what they need, and I've already given them some uh, corrections. So some corrective exercise to take strain off where strain needs to be taken off, right? Now, we, it can go in a lot of different directions depending on who I'm talking to, right? But in that first session, I also might have given them some, uh, some advice on how to keep strain off their body as they're doing something they have to do every day, like maybe at work, right? Mm -hmm how to take some strain out of their life, either by moving better or bracing or something. So I'll tell you where I learned some of this. Back in the 1980s, I was talking to a guy who was a hand-to-hand -hand combat instructor for uh, Israeli special forces. And I said, well, how do you do that? How do you, how do you teach people how to fight with just their hands, you know? And he's like, ah, listen, listen, he says, um, when he gets a class of people in, right? A class of soldiers, because they're in war all the time, they don't know, uh, he doesn't know if he's gonna have these soldiers for two hours, like it says on the schedule, or for one minute, <laughs> right? He doesn't know. Um, so in the first minute, he gives them the most important thing, the most important battlefield survival thing. And if they get through that, he gives them the second most important thing. It's gonna be something easy to learn, right? It can't be all oh, the most kick-ass thing, but it takes you a year to learn. No, no, it has to be something you can learn in two minutes, right? And if they get through that two minutes, 
Okay, they go to the next thing. And he said the first time he was teaching, that's what happened. He was one minute into the class and this siren went off and everybody grabbed their shit and ran off to fight. He's like, oh man, this is how, this is how it is. And he had, to, he had to adjust his whole mindset. Well, I kind of think that way too, right? It's, it's not as urgent and as extreme as that guy's situation. But I've got a person's attention for an hour. That's a good amount of time. Uh, much, much longer than that, people's brains start melting, right? I need to give them the thing that's most important to their survival between now and the next time we meet. And we take it from there. And you see how that, that has nothing to do with any mode or any piece of equipment at all. Nothing. Almost it's a, way, it's a way of it's a way of problem solving. Right. Almost a form of triage in this day and age where people are coming into your gym as a as a hospital. You know, sometimes it does seem like triage. You know, I my top athlete has a leg missing. Right? Well boy, there's a triage for you. Um I've I've trained people who are a lot worse hurt than him. I've trained people who um couldn't sit up, couldn't stand up. People paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, I had a student who couldn't speak. Hmm. But guess what? The principles and the concepts we use don't change. Right? So <clears throat> what, what I think what a coach really needs to do is really understand and try to master a couple of principles and a couple concepts. And that will guide you. That will guide you to the tools and the, and the modes that you need. Right? Yeah, so you mentioned working with, uh, with athletes and the elite athlete who's training for a competition will have very different goals from someone who is trying to play more comfortably on the floor with their grandchildren. Um, for one thing that comes to my mind, uh, you know, a, a professional athlete has a higher threshold for working, uh, working out more often and maybe even tolerating a, a risk of injury or, or sort of getting closer to the point in order to maximize their performance. Um, but do you have a general sort of principle around the like the frequency and intensity because I think in this age we there's also a tendency to think that you can just sort of brutalize yourself back into shape um, and and how do you kind of get people to to slow down when they need to yeah that, that's a great question you're absolutely right that's one of, uh, that's another one of the big problems we have on the American fitness landscape is people try to brutalize themselves uh, into shape or back into shape and of course, that's used a lot in very successful marketing, unfortunately. Um, it's 100% wrong. And I never do that. I do the opposite of that. And, and that's why we get the results we get. And by results, I mean gold medals at the Olympics and uh, a pretty much non-existent injury rate. Okay. And the trust of clinicians that send their patients to us while they're in treatment. Okay, so here's somebody who's hurt. Their clinician has diagnosed them. Okay. But sometimes the clinician gets stuck and they know me and they know they can send their patient down to me and the, and the patient will be safe and healing will be supported. But um, the way I get people out of that, that mode of thinking, because a lot of people do come to me thinking that I have to kick their ass, right? I, I have to practically murder them. Um, during our first conversation, I'm already conditioning them away from that, right? The one where I ask them about their goals. They might not even realize it. But by the time we get to our second session where I'm doing the assessment, they've come over to, they've come over to the dark side, right? <laughs> hmm. Or the light side, whatever you want to call it. They've come over to, over to my way of thinking, right? And 
and they're more, um, they're less obsessed with the sort of panic that seems to overtake people who, who exercise, right? They exercise in this kind of panic of fear, right? Um, by the time we get to our second session, um, they've already started changing their thinking. By the time we get through that first session where they've, they've done their physical assessment and they've, they've learned and practiced some, uh, some restorative exercise, they're really over on my side, right? And each time they do a session with me or do a little homework on their own, they're, they're coming over deeper and deeper into the, into the successful side of, uh, of physical education. Yeah, so the thing that stands out to me in that is the, the idea of not motivating your workouts with fear. And we, we talked about panic earlier. Uh, I think in, in one place I, I was reading, uh, you wrote something about one of the one of your approaches is to replace fear with a physical fear with a sense of confidence. Uh, and what is first of all, what is physical fear as distinct from uh, another kind of fear, say an emotional or mental fear? You know, uh, so physical fear, the way people uh, sometimes feel it um, in my classes is this. Uh, I tell them to do something. They look at the size of the kettlebell or the barbell, and man, I can see their eyes light up. They're fearful, right? Even though they've they've been through you know at least several hours of a of a confidence building uh, program, right? Where they haven't been hurt, um, they've built success upon success. Um, but uh, this is a process that might take years of deprogramming someone who's been in this fear-based fitness culture for 40 or 50 years, right? From the time they were a little child and they were very impressionable, right? That fear was set into them, right? They got bullied or hurt or roughed up or, or terrorized in, in PE or in sports, right? Um, and that sort of continued through their adult life of being shamed at the gym or in, in aerobics classes, uh, being shamed by media, you know, like uh, before there was even, um, you know, uh, the internet, uh, there was women's magazines and men's magazines that were based on shame and fear and anger and all these things. Like uh, if you looked in the old uh, muscle magazines of like the 70s and 80s, they always showed pictures of uh, bodybuilders making these ugly faces like they're being killed. Well, People internalize that and they think they have to go into the gym and make that ugly face while they're training. Well, that's a problem in itself. That just makes shit worse. Okay. So physical fear is something someone will feel just looking at say a, a kettlebell or a, or a barbell that frightens them because they've never lifted anything that big before and they've been conditioned to fear. Or they might try to do something um, and kind of, uh, I won't say fail, but uh, they, they don't have control, mm -hmm. right? And they can feel it. They can feel their body collapsing. And they, they, they haven't handled the thing they, they were trying to handle. And so that's, that's a really tactile kind of fear that can happen. But you know what? It's a process everyone has to go through. I call it striking gold. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And um, I don't let people do a sloppy lift more than once, okay? Well, I, actually, I'm gonna amend that. Sometimes I can tell if somebody bobbles a lift, I can tell that if they try it again, it'll be better. Hmm. And if they try it again, it'll be even better. And I'll let that process go on until it stalls, right? Okay, first lift, oh, it sucks, it's all over the place. Second lift, ooh, way better. Third lift, even better. Fourth lift, Ah, not any better. Okay, that's where I come in and give the person a correction. By the time I finish giving them that correction, I can see a lot of that fear has disappeared, right? Because they trust me as the authority, the coach. I've given them a, a direction that sounds like it makes sense, right? I sound really confident and knowledgeable when I give the correction. They do the correction. Oh man, the lift is way better. 
that physical fear is gone. Okay. So a lot of it is a process of, you know, bumping into that fear and then uh, uh, eliminating it with successes. I see. So, and, and it's funny because there's a sort of tension between the whole principle underlying resistance training, but all fitness uh, really is, you know, the specific adaptation to an imposed demand. And the, the closer you get to uh, failure, where your muscles actually can't physically go any farther, that, you know, that failure is, in a sense, a success. Uh, so we need to reprogram uh, can be right, and I don't. That, you know, that's a uh, one philosophy of of resistance training. Um, although it's it's by no means the only one. Uh, when it comes to giving people more of those feelings of success, you know, the little wins. Uh, how do you give people, uh, you know, an improved emotional state from from exercise rather than the feeling of having been broken down by the end of it. Yeah, and it's a deep subject because in most places on the American fitness landscape, they miss by a mile. They either destroy the person and make them more fearful by injuring them more, or, and I've seen this, this is less, uh, this is more rare, but I see it on a regular basis. Maybe it's in like a, uh, maybe, it might be in what's called a restorative yoga class. Hmm. And that's where like nobody's even fucking moving, right? The, the instructor is, is so fearful of hurting somebody or it's even scaring somebody that they basically have people just laying there. And every once in a while, they'll barely move really slow, right? And... I'm not, I'm not picking on yoga instructors. I see it in all modes, right? These very fearful instructors that because they have no confidence in their own ability, um, they basically have their students do nothing, right? And you'll see a, like a, a, a lady who looks like she could, uh, you know, compete in, um, uh, you know, Ninja Warrior or something. And the instructor has her lifting like a little one pound pink dumbbell. Right, because the instructor's being so careful, right? Well, that's that's slightly better than than hurting someone, but it's also wasting somebody's time and wasting somebody's money. Right? So somewhere in the middle there is the place where you can struggle and then uh win. Struggle and then win the struggle. But you gotta have the struggle. That's striking gold. Striking gold. I like that. And you're you're up there in uh, kind of close to gold country, right? So it's, we're in the middle of it, man. It fits the theme. Yeah, the street right outside these windows here. There's a picture from the 18 from like maybe 1860, where you know the street used to be mud. They covered it with crushed gravel. Well, people started finding gold dust in the crushed gravel. And so you see like a dozen guys down on their knees looking at the rocks. I remember some of my field trips in fourth grade uh, to gold country and it was the most exciting feeling to be, you know, panning for gold and to get a little flake, even this tiniest little flake. So it, it does speak to, you know, what motivates people and uh, it's not just shiny things, but the idea of principle, uh, you know, small, small wins can, can add up to a lot. They can boost your confidence. Uh, and you've actually, in working with, with, these elite athletes, you've had people strike a different kind of gold. Absolutely. The best kind. Russian gold. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a reference to the, the Olympic medals? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, my uh, top athlete, Evan Strong, won uh, uh, border cross at, um, at Sochi in 2014. Very cool. Uh, and what, speaking of sort of uh, Eastern Europe and, and Russia, I want to get into a little bit more of the, the culture question because we are the, the culture club and uh, one of your primary modes is the Russian kettlebell uh, method or, or, or mode and, and um, you've talked about how the Eastern European and Central Asian countries have these ancient traditions embedded in their culture around health. 
uh, that we're lacking in uh, in in wet in the West. Um, can you speak to that a little bit and what it is that drew you to sort of the the Eastern European approach? Yeah, I'm going to lead up to it a little bit by saying um, uh, the first three years I was a student of Pavel Tsitsolin, right? He's known as this big kettlebell guy. First three years I was his student, I never touched a kettlebell. The important thing I was learning was um, Soviet sports science, right? So the tools we used for me to learn that was a barbell, calisthenics, and uh, stretching. And someone said to me, oh, man, you got to do kettlebells. And I'm like, God, ah, Jesus Christ, my, my plate is full, right? So I did three years of work that had nothing to do with a kettlebell. Here's the thing. Um, sports science comes from the Soviet Union. Sports science was basically invented by a guy named uh, Yuri Brikoshansky in the early 60s. He wrote a book called The Transfer of Special Strength in Sports. And a lot of people point to that as the beginning of sports science. That's, a, that's good. But we also know that in ancient Greece, there were coaches, professional coaches, who used sports science. What did they do exactly? Don't know. Um, but they were professional coaches worth working with professional athletes. So, um, and it went on for centuries. So you know they developed some very good methods and modes, and they especially developed, um, you know, problem solving. So the way they do things in those countries of Central Asia and Eastern Europe is totally different from the way we do things here. And that's why they get different results. Um, it's not because of the kettlebell, because you know what? I meet Russians who who they think a kettlebell is a, like a counterweight you use on a scale. They've never seen it used for, for exercise, okay? Because Russia's a big country. And then I meet other Russians who say, oh yeah, we've got these rusty old kettlebells and my father and my grandfather lifted them every day, right? And in that book written by Yuri Verkashansky, there's no mention of a kettlebell. Um, so... I guess really what makes, what makes what I do different, it's not just me, it's a number of my teachers and a number of my colleagues and students. There's, you know, a number of us. What makes um, our results unique and our process unique is knowing and using um, Soviet Russian sports science. Do you think that it was something unique about the Soviet Union's ability to sort of focus single-mindedly on areas that they considered vital interests for their national economy or that, you know, that kind of competitiveness on math, physics, rocket science, the areas that they wanted to show the world that they could be the best, or is it embedded deeper in the, the people's DNA? A uh, little of both. I can tell you this, that around 1900, right? And there started being um, uh, international athletic competitions, right? Um, like the, uh, the Olympics, right? The modern Olympics started in 1896. The czar of Russia and, and some of his advisors, they saw that they could use athletics as propaganda and they could um, use athletics to prove that Russians are superior people. Now, this was mainly, well, you know, maybe it's to intimidate enemies, but it's mainly to fire up their own citizens with that kind of propaganda, right? So they started working on this, and they started doing studies, and they actually sent a bunch of guys east, like into India and China, to study like the martial, uh, the martial systems and healing systems and everything from there. And they came back. And uh, of course, the, uh, the Russian Revolution, the Soviet Revolution interrupted this process. Um, but by 1924, it was going full blast. And the Soviets had decided, yes, we're going to use athletics as propaganda. And so they went at it like, like it was a military operation, right? 
Hmm. And they made every athlete and every coach and every researcher a government employee. Right? And they have to fill out reports about everything they do. And these reports were collected at the Ministry of Sport, right? Which is kind of like the Treasury Department or the Department of Energy, right? And then the experts at the Ministry of Sport would look at everything. And if something looked interesting, they saw some trends happening, they would take it to like a college or a lab somewhere and test the living shit out of it forever to find out if it was really working or if it was just, you know, some weird coincidence. And so then, and then they would, if something came up useful, they would write some manuals about it and send it back out. Well, everybody in the Soviet Union and their satellite countries had uh, access to these manuals. That doesn't mean everyone used them, but it was this collective effort about um, sort of building a culture of success in athletics. And that's where a lot of the information comes from that Pavel Tetsolin uses and I use and Dan John uses, right? Um, they have data sets that we don't have, right? There was a, a test, I think it was done by Anatoly Bondarchuk. There's like a thousand athletes tested for 10 years. I'll tell you what, you really find out some important stuff when you're doing tests like that. This is at University of Kiev. Um, so, um, in, in this country, okay, I'm going to contrast it with how shit gets done or not done in America. In this country, everybody's just kind of randomly doing shit on their own, right? There's no guidance. Uh, a lot of American coaches and trainers are making mistakes today that the Soviets set aside in the 1920s, mm. right? That they haven't made in a hundred years but we're still making it over and over and over and over and over and over again now and still reinventing the wheel. Right. And, uh, nobody's doing any collective effort. Every coach, every school, every team's all working on their own. They all have to rediscover shit that the, the Soviets discovered in the 1920s or the 1930s. Right. So it's funny. Um, when I first started teaching this stuff, a lot of times people would say, oh man, this, this, this seems like cheating, <laughs> right? Because they get so strong so fast that they would surprise themselves. Hmm. And they'd say, this seems like cheating. And I'm like, well, is that kettlebell over your head? Do you feel like you're in control of it? Yes, I do. Do you feel like you're afraid? No. How's that cheating? I don't know. It just seems impossible, right? Um, that's pretty neat, and, and and I wish, uh, or maybe maybe there is, and you can tell me if there if there is a a repository where this kind of technique has been translated, or do you have to go and study with someone who's studied with someone who's learned it from the the original source? Okay, you can buy this book. It's it's the original book that was written by Yuri Verkashansky. It's called um, "The Transfer of Special Strength in Sport." And it's been rewritten by his daughter, Natalia Verkashansky. And it's a lot easier to read. And the, the graphs and the charts in it are, are better. And she also corrected some stuff, right, that was superfluous in the first edition. Anyway, if you want to understand that stuff, anybody can buy that book. It's like, I don't know, 60 bucks. Right. It's a scientific manual. It's pretty dry. <laughs> Often that's where you find the best gems, though. If, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have the first edition, and man, it is so dry. You've got to be a special kind of nerd to read this fucking thing. Well, I, I think that <laughs> that's going to be more, um, accessible. That's going to be a project for Michael Campy. He's the encyclopedia of knowledge and the, the consummate fitness nerd. And, uh, and we keep talking about how a lot of the ideas that are being popularized uh, now that seem, may seem like a fad are actually much older. And the same ideas get cycled through every couple of years in the fitness world because there's such a high turnover rate. Uh, and if, if our hypothesis is that fitness is sort of evolving, that cultural uh, concerns are going to be the driver of successful fitness businesses going forward, uh, there's a few new realities 
since we even began this project, the Culture Club, uh, and the biggest one being the awareness of our susceptibility to a big uh, viral outbreak, a pandemic. And even before this, you know, the, the, the overall immune health of the general population was probably not that great. Uh, so what are some ways that we can use exercise to boost the immune system? Yeah, um, there's a bunch of ways. One is this, correct exercise uh, makes the immune system stronger. What do I mean by correct? Deep question. Bad exercise makes the immune system weaker. See the problem there? Yeah. It's, it's tautological. <laughs> I've, I've got this, yeah. I've got this little um, list I wrote up for uh, uh, an organization I volunteer with. It's called the uh, Nevada County Falls Prevention Coalition. And what they're trying to do, they're trying to intervene into this national crisis we have where um, if a person is over 65 and they fall and break their hip, there's a 75% chance they'll be dead in seven months. See the problem there? Wow. Yeah, so they're trying to intervene in there and they intervene from a lot of different directions. One is getting people to exercise. Another is getting people to adjust the drugs that they're on because a lot of these drugs that you know maybe keep your heart healthy and do some other stuff, um, some of those drugs either screw up your balance or make your bones brittle, right? So, right, that's one of the angles they come in from. You know, there's, there's probably six different angles. Um, so I made up this little list about exercise because what I saw was that this organization came out with manuals, several manuals every year of exercise, and they all sucked. They're just horrible, right? And, uh, you know, the director said, well, you, you can write the new manual. And I said, ah, geez that's a problem. That's, that's focusing on the nail and the hammer, right? We need to focus on the house. So I'm not going to write another sucky manual that no one reads, right? Um, right. Instead, I made a list. It's sort of what I call it, like a reality checklist or a reality filter. And it's six things that should be true about your exercise, right? And the first one is, Right? And this works no matter what mode you're using, right? Doesn't matter if you're doing body pump or uh, fast and fit or, uh, uh, you know, um, yoga or Tai Chi or Qigong, doesn't matter, okay? And the checklist starts with this. Is your exercise pain-free? Answer should be yes. And if it isn't, you need to keep changing shit until it is. Is exercise free of fear? Answer should be yes. If it isn't, you have to keep changing stuff until it's free of fear. Um, next one is, uh, do you get results swiftly and regularly? Answer should be yes. If it's not, you got to keep changing shit. <laughs> and you see how this works no matter what. It works even if you're old. It works even if you're weak. It works even if you're overweight. It works even if you have cancer. It works even if you have fibromyalgia. See what I mean? Right. It's a, such a simple list. There's nowhere to hide in it. And unfortunately, there's no, there's no place for your trainer or your coach or the person who sold you your, your health club membership. There's no place for them to hide, right? Right. Are you doing a lot more online training these days? Yeah, I moved all my, uh, all my in-person training online. So it was uh, 20 classes a week, right? Wow. Either in the studio or out in the park. Um, and I moved it all online. What would you say is the biggest adjustment you've had to make in doing it online? You know, we can't separate the online conversation from the COVID conversation, right? Because, because the whole country was on lockdown, people's, um, people's schedules changed. And so I actually had to change the whole schedule. I had to change the timing of it which is fine. I don't care. We're just here to get people healthy and, um, and athletic. Um, you're teaching people online, but I knew this because I started teaching uh, privates online three years ago. Online, you have to go a little slower, you know, because I'm looking at a screen. I can't see and sense all the things I can see and sense when someone's, you know, 
three feet away from me. And when they're watching me, it's the same thing, right? They can't see on a computer screen all the things they can see and sense in person. So the whole process has to go slower. Okay, and this is a unrelated question. Maybe there's a tie-in, but the intergenerational component to your practice, you train people of all ages, uh, and, and that's a, a concern for, you know, for me seeing my parents getting older, losing muscle mass, uh, without getting too deep into the, the what and the how, I mean, there, there is still the, the all important question of the why, but what sort of a program could you recommend to someone uh, who's concerned about that? Or, you know, if, if they don't even know where to start? Uh, yeah, I've got a list that goes with that list I just started talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that list, um, uh, so there's two lists. Each list has six items. So the second list starts with this. Have you discussed and clarified with your coach um, your goals, your injury situation, and your needs? That's question one. And that list goes from there. And it's like sort of just part two of the things your, your exercise program needs. So um, I'll tell you what, Charlie, I'll send you that list, right? Both parts of it. And that is my all encompassing sweeping um, advice to everyone, right? Doesn't matter if you're young or old. Excellent. Doesn't matter if you're training in person or online. Doesn't matter if you're healthy or hurt. Doesn't much matter if you're a professional athlete or a regular person. Right? Right. And so that'll be a great resource for people. We'll include that in the, the show notes if, if that's okay. And, um, and again, this uh, the the Russian the manual the the transfer of what was it transfer of special strength and science transfer of special strength and sport and strength and sport okay uh, so I want to come back just uh, in the last few minutes here to the the slogan form is function and uh, and let, give you a chance to kind of summarize anything that we talked about or reiterate or bring up anything into the conversation that we didn't get a chance. To talk about um, so again the the idea of form is function uh, people who are are looking to do something very specific say train for an athletic competition or uh, they're in the trades uh, I've, I've thought a lot about because I'm a natural movement practitioner move nat is my main mode and thinking about people who are working say as a, a plumber or a carpenter uh, how I could adapt to uh, to, to that sort of thing, but within the the, I'll, I'll come back to kettlebells for one second because there's a principle there, which is the, uh, how almost every movement in any sport and um, and, and in any profession, it, it does. The, if you're generating power, you need to have that strength in the in the sort of hip hinge area. Although I'm not saying it very eloquently, and I, I am hoping to have you speak to that a little bit. Uh, just as to why this is your method um, that you that you focus on the you know that that motion okay I'm, I'm gonna preface this by saying just because you have a kettlebell in your hand doesn't mean you're gonna do a hip hinge mm. and you can loot you can learn a hip hinge without a kettlebell okay so a kettlebell doesn't bring anything with it it's just a tool like a hammer and a nail uh, there are a few people around that use kettlebells correctly and the results look like black magic but most people don't use it correctly and they might as well not use kettlebells. Okay. Um, the hip hinge, you correctly surmise that that is a really juicy subject to talk about. And Dan John talks about it. Chip Conrad talks about it. Ron Jones talks about it a hell of a lot. And so do I. And it's uh, one of the first things I teach people. Right. And here's the thing. Someone might not be able to hip hinge. Well, if they can't, that's the only thing we're working on, really, <laughs> until they can. See what I mean? It's that important. 
that's where all the power comes from for sport and for life. Okay. Now you might think, Oh, how powerful do I have to be for life? Well, maybe not all that powerful, but you do need to be safe and you do need to be efficient. If you're going to, if you're going to do the things you want to do, right? Um, if your hip doesn't hinge, your lower spine and your knees cannot be stable. There's a problem, right? Good news is this. As soon as you improve your hip hinge, your lower spine gets more stable. Your knees get more stable. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful, beautiful. It is. It's so simple. And if you look at any sport, whether it's the baseball swing or, uh, you know, a, a throwing motion, you're channeling that energy. It goes, it starts from the hips and then gets transferred out where the, the limbs are almost just an extension of that power from the Yeah, the, the power the spreads out in both directions, up and down, right? Right. It's a beautiful thing. And it's something you never see on the American fitness or even sports landscape. You know, I, I've been a competitive athlete for 50 years, right? I was in Little League when I was six years old. And every once in a while, I'd come across a coach or a gym teacher that said, put your hip into it. That's as far as the conversation ever went. The guy couldn't demonstrate it. Um, I realize now that my, my colleagues that were hitting home runs every time, they were putting their hip in it, man. You know, six, seven-year-old kid had perfect hip power. They understood it intuitively. Even they if... didn't understand shit. Their body was programmed to do it. Yeah. And um, sitting all the time in classrooms hadn't disconnected from their, disconnected them from their hip hinge, although it had disconnected me. See what I mean? Hmm. People are different, right? Some people are more brutalized by modern life than others, right? And those people that can kind of... Uh, be sort of impervious to the to the the detrimental effects of modern life shit they might grow up to be uh, elite athletes right the rest of us oh shit right we might be in a world of hurt last news, oh go ahead the good news is we can affect the situation right, right. And, and the last question is how you know and feel free to just add any thoughts at the end of this to summarize what we've been talking about but how can people become more resilient uh, and better prepared for the challenges that might be coming in the future? Yeah. You know what? It's that list. It's that list I'm going to send you, right? And if something's not working, part, part of what's on that list is this. If something's not working, change it, but don't change it too fast, okay? Uh, people have a tendency to either do something that's not working for 20 or 30 years and just be kind of stupid about it and bullheaded and say, well, it, it should be working. All the professionals say it works. And so they keep doing it even though it's not working, okay? That's not the way to do it. And then other people, they'll do something for five minutes and it feels too much like work and they hate it, so they stop right then. Somewhere in the middle uh, is the path to success and it's something like this. Try something for three or four weeks. Be diligent, follow the instructions, and if there's no effect, try something else. See what I mean? It's a, yep. Now, if you're doing something for a few months, and um, you stop getting results, change something. See what I mean? That's kind of the, the general advice of how to keep progress moving forward. Spoken like a true prospector. If it's not working, try somewhere else. Try another, another plot. Yeah, but you've uh, got to dig for more than five, five minutes, right? There you go, right. Might have to dig for four weeks. Well, it's been a, a pleasure speaking with you, Eric. And uh, for, for the audience, you can find Eric Kenyon at uh, kettlebellform.com. Form is function is the, the name of his practice. 
and he's got the the recipe for for striking gold so check him out and uh and and thanks a lot eric for taking the time my pleasure charlie hey there cultured person if you liked this episode you'll love our guide strong values six questions for struggling fitness professionals get it for free when you sign up for our email list You'll also get access to our full library of interviews, plus weekly links delivered to your inbox featuring the best fitness-related articles from around the web.